from the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal. This is Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Hello and welcome to Free Expression from the Wall Street Journal. I'm Jerry Baker, editor-at-large of the journal. If you're not already a subscriber to this podcast, please do sign up wherever you do your listening. This week, it's exactly four years since the country's schools, workplaces, restaurants, gyms, and just about all our public places were locked down by official mandate as the COVID-19 pandemic hit the United States. We were told at the time by public health leaders, government officials, scientific experts, and with especially self-confident insistence by the media that lockdowns were essential to contain the spread of the virus and save many lives. Well, four years on, what have we learned? Some experts do continue to claim that the measures were effective in limiting the incidence of serious illness and death. The data are mixed on that question. What we do know is that the cost of lockdowns was much higher than we were ever told at the time in terms of economic losses, years of children's education missed, increased incidence of other illnesses as patients weren't seen or treated, huge increases in mental health problems through loneliness, depression and other conditions. At the time, of course, almost everyone who questioned the wisdom of lockdowns and asked whether this balance of risks, viral spread on the one hand versus the kind of economic and social dystopia we had on the other, they were dismissed as cranks, conspiracy theorists, or even, in many cases, killers. Critics were blocked on social media and largely ignored or denounced by mainstream media, often at the behest of officials. Just as, by the way, were those who suggested that COVID might have emerged from a Chinese lab rather than a market claim that now seems to be widely viewed as a quite likely explanation. One of those who spoke out at the time and was roundly criticised was Martin Koldorf, professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and an expert in epidemiology and biostatistics. Koldorf was an early sceptic of lockdowns and many other favoured COVID measures, and he was one of the eminent scientists who signed the Great Barrington Declaration in the fall of 2020, calling for an end to general lockdowns and for more targeted measures aimed at protecting the most vulnerable in the population. For his efforts, Koldorf has been denounced by many of his colleagues at Harvard for several years, and indeed, of course, more widely. This week, in an article in City Journal, he announced that he's no longer a professor of medicine at Harvard because, as he put it, he insisted on, quote, clinging to the truth as the world lost its way during the COVID pandemic. Yes, he looks like he's become another victim of cancel culture and the intolerance of intellectual diversity on elite college campuses. That story of COVID and our public response to it has huge implications and lessons. How do we handle future pandemics and other health emergencies? Most, perhaps most importantly, but it also shone a light on the troubling way in which science, which was held up as irrefutable, objective, unchallengeable, can be used and abused for policy and ideological objectives. It's one of the reasons so many Americans have declining trust in their major institutions. And of course, we've also learned a lot more about the deteriorating climate of academic freedom on our university campuses. Well, Professor Koldorf has been in many ways at the intersection of all of these trends over the last three, four years, and I'm pleased to say he joins me now. Martin Koldorf, thanks very much for joining Free Expression. Jerry, thanks for having me. So, Professor, so much I want to talk to you about, obviously, about COVID itself, about what we learned about academic freedom and scientific trust in science, all these things. But let's just get to the actual immediate story. You wrote this week that you're no longer a professor at Harvard. Now, can you tell us exactly what happened? It's been reported that you've been fired, that Harvard says, no, you were affiliated with a hospital. And when your affiliation with that hospital no longer continues, then your position at Harvard. Can you just clear this up for us? What were you told? You've been a professor there for 20 years. How did this uh, all come to an end? So the vast majority of faculty members in the Harvard School of Medicine were technically for one of the Harvard hospitals. So uh, I was at the Brigham Women's Hospital, which is part of the Mass General Brigham. So they uh, fired me. And when they fired me, my faculty sort of position was put on leave. And then after two years, the university ended that. So why did the hospital fire you? So there was a disagreement about uh, vaccines. So I believe that what we've known since 430 BC, that there is infection-acquired immunity. We've known that since the Athenian plague. And uh, for some reason, Harvard hospitals did not believe in that. Neither did Harvard, because it was only last week that they removed their vaccine mandates for students. So I was in disagreement that I had had COVID. 
So I had infection acquired immunity that was superior to vaccine immunity. And I applied for a medical exemption and they gave a lot of exemptions to other members, but I didn't get one, even though I have an immune deficiency that's genetics called alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So they were clearly not interested in having me stay there, giving me that exemptions. And uh, there was clearly a disagreement. I think that hospitals should have hired rather than fired staff that uh, had natural immunity. They had the nurses, for example, who worked with COVID patients in 2020. And they got COVID, so they had to stay home for a while. And then they came back and continued to care for COVID patients. And then you have these bureaucrats, both at Harvard and at Harvard hospitals, that decided that, no, they cannot work there anymore, even though they had superior immunity, posing much less risk to the patients than those who were vaccinated. So to be clear, it wasn't simply a question of a scientific disagreement about the efficacy of vaccines. It was because the Brigham Hospital has a policy that you must be vaccinated and they wouldn't give you an exemption. Is that right? They didn't give me an exemption. And of course, I don't see any patients, so there was no reason for me to have vaccines for that either, even if I hadn't had COVID. So do you think it was more to do with your public status as a critic of so many of the official public health responses to COVID? So I know colleagues who did receive the exemption, but who knows? Diverse those things. Let's get into these questions. As I say, you were a very early critic of lockdowns. And by the way, you know, as it's noted at the beginning, we're now the fourth anniversary this week of when these lockdowns really began here in earnest in the United States and continued, you know, as we know, for some states for a couple of years. You were an early critic. You were one of the prominent scientists who signed the Great Barrington Declaration, which was later on in 2020. But you questioned, and of course, as the Great Barrington Declaration did, the efficacy and indeed the wider damage that we be caused by having such broad lockdowns, the types we had which shut down schools and workplaces and public places and various things like that. And instead, you argued strongly for a more targeted approach to protecting the more vulnerable in society. Four years on, what's the evidence you think we have here on your position versus the position of those who said, no, 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 we had to have a lockdown? Well, now it's quite clear. And unfortunately, we were proven right that there has been a lot of collateral public health damage and also damage on education for children without any best benefits to COVID. So uh, Sweden was the one major Western country who didn't lock down. Uh, they did take precautionary measures, the nursing homes, etc. But they kept, for example, the schools open for uh, all the children uh, ages 1 to 15 uh, during that spring of 2020 and on. Uh, and among those 1.8 million children in schools and daycare, exactly zero of them died from COVID that spring with only a few hospitalizations. It was very clear early on that it was safe to keep kids in schools. And there was a report from the Swedish Public Health Agency in that summer of 2020, early summer, that showed that with children also showed that the teachers were at no higher risk than other professions. And they also really didn't implement other lockdowns. And we can now look at excess mortality among major Western countries. Sweden has the lowest excess mortality during 2020 to 22 into 2023. So they came out well because the lockdowns didn't do much for COVID, but then there was this other collateral damage. And that will continue because many of the cancer patients, maybe they didn't get the screening or treatment, so they might still be alive, but they will not die maybe two or three years from now instead of living another 10 years. Again, it was dramatically underplayed four years ago, the damage that will be done up to the economy, to children's education, to health care in terms of people not seeing doctors for other conditions, all of the damage we saw. But you also say that the evidence is that lockdowns maybe weren't as effective as they were claimed to be back then. But let me just put to you, and again, I'm sort of playing devil's advocate here. I'm looking at the latest data that we have for death rates. Well, I know it's a very crude measure, but it's obviously the most important measure in many ways. Death rates adjusted by age, by state in the United States. These are the CDC numbers. We can argue about whether the CDC numbers are reliable, I suppose. But anyway, the CDC official numbers say, for example, that the age-adjusted death rate in Florida was 111 per is that all costs or COVID? That's COVID. And in New York State, it was 83.9. So significantly more favorable outcome in New York, which, of course, did famously lock down for much deeper and much longer. Florida locked down initially and then lifted most of its restrictions quite soon. California also has a number somewhat lower than Florida's. It does look as though states that locked down longer and harder did end up, not always dramatically, but did end up on average with a somewhat better 
outcome in terms of deaths. Do you accept that? No, that's not the COVID mortality numbers I've seen. Florida did better than the average, so we guess below average. California was about the same as Florida's year of age. New York and, for example, Texas were among the worst states. And the, some of the best states were like Maine, Vermont, and Hawaii. So that doesn't exactly correspond to the numbers I've seen. Again, it's on the CDC website, National Center for Health Statistics, and it lists death rate, yeah, COVID-19 mortality by state, and it lists death rates by state, age adjusted. And yeah, the numbers are 111 for Florida, 83 for New York. States like Oklahoma, which had relatively limited lockdowns, Alabama, I mean, I know there are plenty of other data and we can come on and talk about Sweden, your native Sweden in a minute. But at least as far as those data are concerned, it does look as though, and again, I'm sure there are all kinds of ways of looking at this. It does look as though that maybe overall, maybe there were better outcomes associated with deeper lockdowns. What time period is that? 20 and 21, when the major deaths were. Yeah, OK. So the numbers I've seen was like 20, 21 and 22. OK. So like a longer time period. Right. I mean, some of the states had more in the beginning and some of them had more in the end. So, for example... Very early on, the New York state was very bad. I think New York and New Jersey was the worst one. But then later on, they sort of dropped down a little bit in the ranking. And they have these different seasonal patterns. So in the northern United States, the winter is the main peak. In southern U.S., there's like both a winter and a summer peak. Right. So the numbers I said was sort of at least three, three and a half years period. Okay. And on that basis, as you say, it, no significant difference or, in fact, maybe slightly better for states that didn't lock down for quite as much. Yeah. South Dakota famously did not lock down. They did have some school closings. We can compare it to North Dakota, and they are very, very similar in the COVID mortality rates. And the famous example, as I say, internationally, of course, is Sweden. You know a lot about Sweden, because you're a native. Tell us, first of all, what Sweden did and didn't do, and what the lessons were in terms of the outcome. Well, I think they tried to protect the older people by letting children go to schools, and they didn't lock down restaurants and uh, businesses, letting young adults live normal lives. But they recommended older people to be very precautious. Also, when the vaccine came, they were very strict with an age-based approach, unlike the United States. And there were actually some people who got fired because they worked as an administrator and they got the vaccine ahead of schedule and they were fired because of it. So it was very strict to do it age-based. And I think that was a good thing. So I think that Sweden did generally very good. They had some problems with the nursing homes in the Stockholm area in the spring of 2020 with too much staff rotation. And there are other things, details one can criticize, but I think their philosophy and the general thing was quite good. And if we look at education, for example, we see that the test results for kids in the U.S. plummeted. They went down. Which is not a surprise because education, they go to school to learn. And if they don't go to school, then they learn less. So that was not a surprise. But in Sweden, when they looked at educational testing results, there was no decline. So that's an important thing. And if I could change one thing with the pandemic would be to keep the schools open. I think they had no benefit and enormous harms. And not only for test scores, also for children. It's very important to have the social interaction with other children to build up the social skills. And that's also something that they lost out on during the pandemic because of the lockdowns. What is absolutely clear is the insistence by public health officials on the unimpeachability, if you like, and the unchallengeability of their science and of their practice. And, and again, you had some experience of that, but efforts to discredit anybody who challenged the official narrative. Again, that was a pretty insistent effort, wasn't it? Yes. And if you had told me about this four years ago, I would have laughed at you and wouldn't have believed it. So that's sort of very surprising. I was censored on social media at the behest of the federal government, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and so on. And the NIH director, Francis Collins, asked for a published takedown on me and Sunita Gupta and Jay Bharashari after writing the Great Bank Declaration, calling us fringe epidemiologists. And of course, they are very powerful because Francis Collins and Anthony Fauci, they sit on the biggest pile of uh, research money in the world. So if you're a scientist, you have to be careful to criticize them. And you take a risk if you do. I mean, again, I can understand if there's a genuine belief that there is a public health emergency and the only way to deal with that emergency is to tell people to stay home and wear masks and do all of that kind of stuff. And that, you know, there's a genuine need to really ram home that message, because if people have doubts about that message, then maybe they'll do the wrong thing. But it went way beyond that. As you say, people like you were literally blocked from saying things. The media, I mean, I think to me, again, as someone who works in the media, this is the most striking thing. The insistence of the media, not just in, again, 
again, promoting the official message, but in going out of its way to denounce and ridicule and demean everybody who disagreed. I mean, what do you think was going on? How did we get to this culture where everybody in positions of influence like that were demanding kind of fealty to the official line? Well, I am a simple scientist. So as a journalist, you probably understand those societal things much better than I do. I wish I did. I'm just dumbfounded by it. We can contrast with Sweden because I tried to publish in the US in the spring of 2020. I was unable to do so, but I was able without problem to publish in the major daily newspapers in Sweden. But there was sort of the opposite discussion there because there were some people who criticized it. There's a group of 22 scientists, I think only one or two ethnologists, but they criticized it and they published their criticism. And then there was a discussion. And even though I disagree with them, I'm very grateful that they did voice those concerns because there were obviously other people who had it. They read foreign newspapers. So it was actually very good that they did that. And then those of us who supported the Swedish approach with focus protections instead of lockdowns, could sort of defend it. And that discussion was very important. And the Swedish approach has very broad support by the Swedish public. But I think that you should never try to enforce something in public health. You have to maintain that trust. And public health has not a lot of trust. We'll take a short break there. But when we come back, I'll have more with Professor Martin Kuldov, formerly Harvard University professor. And we'll be looking not just at decisions that were made during COVID, but also what we learned about the wider climate of freedom of speech and of authoritarian culture that some of our leaders seem to subscribe to. Stay with us. You're listening to Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Don't forget, you can listen to the latest episode anytime on your smart speaker. Just say, play the Opinion Free Expression podcast. Now, back to Jerry Baker. Welcome back. I'm speaking with Professor Martin Koldoff, former professor at Harvard, and a strong critic of many of the measures that were put in place for dealing with COVID, including lockdowns. Let's talk about vaccines too. And well, let's get on to the vaccine mandate in a minute. But the actual vaccines themselves, again, when I'd like to hear your view on the efficacy of vaccines overall, but there does seem to be good evidence that vaccines have been for particular sections of the population. And I'm sure we'll talk about those with prior immunity in a minute. But for particular sections of the population, vulnerable segments of the population, there does seem, I think, some evidence. I think it's fair to say you contradict me if you like about the efficacy of vaccines. But it's certainly true, isn't it, that claims were made about the kind of universal efficacy of vaccines that were not substantiated at the time, either by the trial evidence that the various drug companies did or by what we started to see once the vaccine started to be um, distributed in the population. Yes, and unfortunately, being a, the vaccine discussion has been very black and white. That's very unfortunate because it isn't. So because everybody can get COVID, but there's a more than a thousandfold difference in risk between the old and the young. So if you're old you have a fairly high risk of dying from COVID if you get it, maybe 1%. And then if you can prevent that with the vaccine or reduce, not prevent it, but even reduce it, that's worthwhile. And even if the vaccine has a small risk of an adverse reaction, and most vaccines and drugs have there's a risk with some adverse reaction. I've been working with that for over two decades. On the other hand, if you are a young adult or a child with very small risk of dying, or if you've already had COVID, so you already have good immunity, then even a small risk from the vaccine will sort of tip that benefit risk in other direction. So uh, there was a lack of realization that the underlying risk of dying from COVID influenced who should get the vaccines and who maybe shouldn't. There was also, of course, problems, I think, with the clinical trials because the clinical trials, they are randomized, which they should be, but they looked at symptomatic disease, symptomatic COVID. And that's not the right outcome because I don't want to seem heartless, but I don't really care if you're home a few days in bed from COVID. What I care about is that you don't die from COVID and also not to be hospitalized. But they recruited mostly younger and middle-aged adults to these trials, and they would survive no matter what, whether they had the vaccine or not. So they should have really recruited more people in the 70s and 80s and the 90s because those were the ones who could potentially benefit from the vaccine. And then we would have known from the clinical trials whether they reduced mortality or not. And Christine Stable Ben and other her colleagues in Denmark, they did an excellent study because there was not power enough to look at the mortality from each individual trials, but they pulled the mRNA trials for Pfizer and Moderna. And then on the other hand, they pulled the 
adenovirus vector vaccines, J&J, and AstraZeneca and Sputnik, and they pulled those. And then they looked at uh, the results from the deaths from those randomized trials. And of course, it's only short-term mortality because they ended the trials. And it's only reflective of young and middle-aged people, not older people. But they found that adenovirus vector vaccines, uh, J&J and AstraZeneca, reduced mortality by about 70%, the point estimate, at least 30% based on the confidence intervals. While the mRNA vaccines had no results, there was neither benefit or uh, harm from these vaccines based on that randomized trials. Now, that's for younger and middle-aged adults. So I think that they did save lives for older people because they had more benefits from the vaccines. But there really should have been randomized trials with mortality as the outcome. Do you think the extent of adverse reactions, adverse effects of the vaccines was understated? There was that brief period when there were a number of cases of younger people, I think in particular, experiencing issues, I mean, heart. Myocarditis. Yes, exactly. Myocarditis and other things. I mean, do you think a significant number of people have been harmed by vaccines? And again, I'm completely clear about what you say that, of course, older people should be, but younger people who were really not at risk, maybe some of them had already had you know, prior immunity from having COVID, were given vaccines and then had these very bad adverse reactions in some cases up to and including, obviously, mortality. Do you think the incidence of that was significant? And is that something we should be concerned about? Well, the excess risk from myocarditis is very clear, and I don't think anybody's disputing that, and especially in younger men. The question is how serious it is, and we don't really have all the information about the full picture of adverse reactions from these vaccines. And that's natural because it takes time to get that. So eventually we'll know more about exactly how much adverse reaction were. The various data is, tends to be not very good to look at that, but there's better data like the Vaccine Safety Data Link and the best system that the FDA is running. So we will eventually find out more. But I mean, in the literature now, there's very conflicting papers. There's one paper claiming that the vaccine kills 17 million people. And there's another paper that claims that the vaccine saved 14 million people. But neither of these are very reliable. They're based on modeling that's very unreliable. So I don't think they can really either of those things. And we don't really know. From what you've seen of the evidence you've seen, and again, you're a biostatician, you've presumably seen a lot more data than almost anybody else. Do you think on balance, again, especially for vulnerable populations, that the vaccine on net saved a significant number of lives? So I think for older people, the vaccine did save people's lives. For children and young adults, I think that there's a big question mark. Do you think it may, for the young children and young adults, may have cost more lives than it saved? We don't know. So we were told that despite all the scientific evidence we've had, as you said at the start, for two and a half thousand years about the effectiveness of prior infection and immunity gained from prior infection that was nothing like as effective in terms of preventing transmission of COVID or preventing getting sick from COVID as the vaccine. Was that true? I mean, was there something unique about COVID that somehow the immunity you obtain from prior infection was somehow very, very weak and very limited? No, that's not true. So we knew early on that people who had been infected early, they were often not reinfected. And if they were, they were much milder. So uh, we knew from early on that there was good immunity from prior infections. It would have been very, very surprising if the vaccine had better efficacy than having had the disease, because the vaccine is sort of trying to mimic what the immune system does if you are exposed to the disease. So it would have been shocking if the vaccine was better. And then when the studies came out to compare it, there was the first study on it was from Israel showing that for hospitalizations, the, having had COVID gave you eight times better protection than uh, having had the vaccines. Both protected, but it was a much better effect, efficacy from having had COVID. And that's what you would expect. So it's really astonishing that you would mandate the vaccine for those who've had it, it sort of is very unscientific. So to me, when like a university does that, that's sort of like having a university questioning whether the earth is round or flat, which we have known also about for about two and a half thousand years. But it's also very unethical because let's assume that it was the perfect vaccine. No adverse reactions, nothing. The most perfect vaccine you can ever imagine. Then you should not vaccinate those people who don't need it. 
when you have a shortage of vaccine doses. And that's what we did. We mandated it for, for example, college students who have very low risk, even if they haven't had COVID. And if they've ever had COVID, they don't need it at all. So uh, at the same time, my 87-year-old neighbor, she hadn't gotten it. She was retired, so there was no mandate for her, but she hadn't gotten it yet. And there were many people, not just in the U.S., but around the world, Brazil, India, Nigeria, and so on, that there was shortage of vaccines. They wanted the vaccines, but they couldn't get them. So it was very unethical, in my view, when you have a shortage of vaccines, to vaccinate those people who don't need it when there are a lot of people who do need it that don't get the vaccine. Wasn't it also the case that a lot of those vaccine mandates were applied on the grounds that, again, even if young people on the whole were getting very seriously sick or dying at very, very, very low rates, that they could still transmit the virus to people, especially in a school environment, let's say to an older teacher, someone with a more vulnerable immune system. Whereas, in fact, we learned pretty quickly, didn't we, that actually, while the vaccine did seem to be effective in reducing the severity of symptoms and indeed of the possibility of mortality, it didn't really seem to do anything at all in terms of preventing the spread. Is that a correct characterization? Yes, the virus will still spread. Even if you were vaccinated, you will eventually get the vaccine. But that's not a surprising thing because actually, if you think of it more theoretically, you can have a vaccine that limits the transmission, but you can also have a vaccine that increases transmission. So that can happen with a vaccine. For example, if you have a vaccine that removes the symptoms, but you still have the vaccine in your body, you still spread it, then that person, instead of lying home in bed by themselves, they might be out and about infecting others. So a vaccine that reduces symptoms, but doesn't sort of eliminate the vaccine from the body could actually increase the transmission rather than decrease it. So either of those scenarios are theoretically possible when it comes to a vaccine. You famously, you got a lot of criticism at one point during the pandemic for tweeting a picture of Afghan women wearing burqas and students wearing masks and sort of implying that there was a kind of similarly, just as the Taliban were insisting on covering women because of their authoritarian inclinations, there was a similar authoritarian inclination that was making authorities, school authorities and others, uh, you know, insist on people wearing masks. You know, you did get some criticism for that. But that specific analogy aside, were we also misled about the efficacy of masks? So I think that's one of the very few tweets that I erased because it wasn't very popular. It's the ones you erased in my recollection that always live forever on the internet. Yeah, but I think there are certainly increasing authoritarian tendencies uh, both in the US as well as in Western Europe. And I think that is concerning. I mean, were masks effective? What's the latest evidence we have for how effective masks were in stopping or slowing the spread? So there were two randomized trials on masks for COVID. One was the Danish study that randomized people to wearing a mask or not. And then they said if they got infected or not, and it didn't show any efficacy. Then there was a Bangladesh study in Bangladesh. Uh, it was very brilliantly done because it randomized villages instead of individuals. So by randomizing villages, you can look both the efficacy of masks of the person who wear it, but also other people, whether that person will transmit it to them. And that's, of course, a very interesting question. And they found that it reduced infection by between 0 and 18%. That was the confidence in vote. So basically, it means that either these masks didn't work or it had a minuscule effect. So I think that's a very clear verdict on masks. And I think there was a problem because people were being told that these masks work and they will protect you. And that wasn't the true method because there were as best minuscule protections. So, but what happened was that people would trust, OK, I have a mask. I can go out and about and be safe. So you'll have like somebody who is 77 years old putting on the mask to go to a crowded restaurant, thinking they are protected when they are not. So it's very, very dangerous to not be truthful about these things and pretend that something works when it doesn't because people will believe you and then they will take risks they shouldn't. This 77-year-old person should not be in a crowded restaurant during the height of the pandemic. So this message on the mask could actually have killed people because of that. And one of the tweets I wrote where I pointed this out and that was censored. I wasn't allowed to point out that making people overconfident in masks could actually put them at risk. First, I want to very briefly, the time we have, talk about just about the wider implications of all this climate that we have lived through for the last few years and you've been through directly as someone who's been very much a target of critics. I mean, what does all this do, this you know, misleading information and more importantly, the attempt to quash and to extinguish challenging information? What does it do to public trust 
in science, in medicine, in public health? I think it's very damaging. And I think that trust has gone down and for good reasons. But I think the scientific community has now responsibility to slowly try to uh, regain its integrity. And I think an important part of that is that you have to have academic freedom, you have to have freedom of speech, and you should not discuss the facts in a passionate way. That's good, but not in a polite way without slander and bullying. For that purpose, together with Jay Bhattacharya and Scott Atlas, where we have set up Academy for Science and Freedom with the help of Hillsdale College to sort of address this important issue, because if we can't have a good scientific discussions and debates where things can be honestly debated, then I think science is toast or the scientific community is toast. Science will always be there in the background whether anybody cares about it or not, but the scientific community is going to decline. And I think one of the pillars of Western society is our scientific work that we have done during the last four or five hundred years. In terms of the climate and university campuses, I've talked a lot about this on this podcast, but what you went through at Harvard, what others, some of your colleagues have been through at Stanford and elsewhere, the most eminent, prominent universities in America and the world, and the sometimes successful attempts to crush and to silence alternative views. Is that all of a piece, do you think, with the kind of monolithic, ideological and sort of authoritarian environment that so many universities seem to be praising? Yeah, I think it's part of authoritarian tendencies. And to me, that's very troubling, not only in terms of science and academia, but in society at large. I mean, political freedom is very important, individual freedoms, the freedom of speech. And I don't think we as a society can really survive as a good society without that. So I think the scientific or academic part is just one part reflecting trends in the whole society. So I think we have to try to fight about that. And uh, I'm a co-plaintiff in a current case that will be heard by the Supreme Court on Monday. Oh, good. Missouri versus Biden, which has been renamed Murphy versus Missouri, which is whether the federal government can pressure social media companies to censor certain things that they don't like. And finally, Professor, what's next for you then? Now, no longer associated with Harvard, what's your next move? Well, to feed my children, I'm doing various consulting activities, but also I'm working with Hillsdale and Jay Bhattacharya and Scott Atlas on this initiative on Academy for Science and Freedom, where we hope to reform how science operates. I think it has to be more decentralized. We have to to restructure how we do scientific publishing, because right now there's sort of a cartel system, not in science as a whole, but each area of science has sort of a cartel system, as has been described by Sunita Gupta, where you have a small group of people who control the funding of the journals, and you can't really uh, sort of oppose that. So we found during the pandemic that some of the key papers that came out, for example, uh, vaccine versus national immunity and mass, and so came from the periphery, like small countries which have excellent scientists, but they have independent funding. So they don't depend on the big funders in the, in the UK and the US. The countries like Denmark, Sweden, Iceland, Israel and Qatar, for example, they all published a number of very, very important studies during this pandemic. And I think they benefited from not being sort of being on the sideline a little bit. They had more freedom. They weren't dependent on NIH funding or funding from the Wellcome Trust in, in the UK. Well, very good luck with all of that. And Professor Martin Koldorf, thanks very much for joining Free Expression. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you so much. Well, that's it for Free Expression this week. Thanks very much for joining us. I'll be back next week with another episode. In the meantime, have a great week. 